It is a good thing to sing praise to our God. I'm glad that you are part of this online worship service provided by Calvary Baptist Church. If you don't know, Calvary is located in the beautiful central coast of New South Wales in Australia. My name is Steve, and as pastor of Calvary, I want to open this service with a call to worship from Psalm 5. Note how this psalm addresses God as our King. Hearken unto my voice, the voice of my cry, O my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, in the morning, O Lord, I will direct my prayer to thee, and I will look up. And with this service we look up in expectant hope because we know God is with us and we know God is good. May his goodness and grace be with you through this service and through the coming week, and may all glory be to him. Through our God we shall do valiantly, it is he who will tread down our enemies, will sing and shout the victory. Christ is King, for God has won the victory and set his people free. His word has slain the enemy, the earth shall stand and see that through our God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our enemies, will sing and shout the victory. Christ is King, for God has won the victory and set his people free. His word has slain the enemy, the earth shall stand and see that through our God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our enemies, will sing and shout the victory. Christ is King, Christ is King, Christ is King. Oh, 
Will you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you as the great eternal one, our creator, our redeemer, the merciful and true and gracious God who loves us with an everlasting love. There are concerns that we have on our heart. We have concerns for our world with war breaking out. We pray particularly for the peace of Israel, your people. We pray for their protection. We pray that through this awful crisis, you would give comfort to those who have lost and that you will give justice. And we pray, Father, for Ukraine, for other places where conflict is raging. We pray, Father, on both sides of the conflict, you'd be with people who are suffering. And we pray, Father, that where there is injustice and where there are evil leaders, that they might be deposed and that righteousness would prevail. And Father, we pray ultimately for the return of Jesus Christ, who will put an end to all wars. Lord, we pray on a national level for our government. May our leaders be mindful of their responsibility to you, and may they be guided by you to make decisions that are just and right. Lord, on the level of our family, we pray for any who do not know you as Savior, would you be merciful to convince them and to give them the hope that will never pass away. And Lord, for those in our family who might be going through hardship, whether that be physical hardship or financial hardship, or maybe they're having difficulty with some relationship, we pray, Father, that you would provide grace and that you would provide relief. And Lord, for our friends, we ask similarly for any who are suffering that you would be with them. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. For we prayed it in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen. The God of Abraham prays, who reigns enthroned above, the ancient of eternal days, and God of love, Jehovah, great I am, by earth and heaven confirmed. We bow and bless the sacred name forever blessed. He by himself has sworn, we on his oath depend. We shall on eagle's wings upborn to heaven ascend. We shall behold his face, we shall his power adore, and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. The God who reigns on high, the great archangel sing, and holy, holy, holy cry, Almighty King, who was and is the same, and evermore shall be, eternal for the great I am, we worship Thee.
Leadership spills are a part of political life here in Australia. With our parliamentary system, sometimes the Prime Minister or the State Premier that is ruling over us is someone that we did not directly elect. It happens that a party is elected and the one that we voted for to be Prime Minister ends up being caught up on the wrong side of factions within his or her own party and they end up replacing that person with a colleague. Leadership spills. Jesus faced the threat of leadership spills. He was announced as the king. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John the Baptist said. That's what Jesus said of himself. The kingdom was at hand because the king was present. The apostle Peter made that good confession. Do you remember? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ, that's not only Savior, Messiah, but that's also King. He was professing that Jesus is the King. King. But that didn't prevent attempts at leadership spills. We're going to look today at Mark chapters 10, 11, and 12. Three chapters. That doesn't mean this is going to be a longer sermon. It's more of a survey that we're doing with this message. Because there are seven attempts at a leadership spill, each from a different faction. And we want to see how Jesus comes out. Is he truly the king of kings? Is he the one in charge? Does he truly have authority? What we will discover is the sermon in a sentence. Jesus is Lord, now and forevermore. Both now and forevermore. So turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 10, and we will begin with the first faction, the first of seven factions that opposed Jesus and tried to usurp his leadership. And which was the first of the seven factions? It was those who were closest to him, the disciples. The disciples challenged the authority and leadership of Jesus. It's rather perverse, isn't it, that leadership challenges often come from those who are closest to us. Here in Australia, it happened many years ago, but it's still a fresh memory for many people. Kevin Rudd, our Prime Minister, was spilt by Julia Gillard, his deputy. It was only hours before the spill that Julia Gillard, on national television, right in front of all the media, pledged allegiance to Kevin Rudd. She was loyal to Kevin Rudd. She supported him as the Prime Minister. <laughs> the next morning, Julia Gillard had pushed him out the door, and she was the Prime Minister. Well, it ended up working in reverse. Kevin Rudd spilt her back a few years after that. They were the closest together. And so it is that Jesus was threatened by those who were closest to him. It all began back in Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. You say, I don't hear anything of a leadership spill in that verse. Now this is where the heads of the disciples started to get too big. Jesus sent them out to minister on their own, and he gave them power. And they exercised that power, and they saw, wow, look, we can command evil spirits, and we can heal people. Look at what we can do. And they were all about themselves and nothing about Jesus, not recognizing, not acknowledging, or being appreciative that it was the power of Jesus that was at work. It wasn't power that they possessed within themselves. How do we know that they got big heads? Well, later in that same chapter, chapter 6, verses 35 and 36, we read this. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about, and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Do you see what happened there? The disciples gave a command 
to Jesus. <laughs> who do they think they are? Well, I'll tell you who they think they are. They think they have authority. They think that they've made it. They just went on this ministry tour on their own, and they were able to command demons and all that sort of thing. And now, with their heads too big for themselves, they command Jesus. Skip ahead a couple of chapters to chapter 8, where Peter made that good confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But hardly a moment had passed, and that same Peter was usurping the authority of Jesus. Mark eight thirty two, And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Peter rebuked the Lord, thinking he knew better than the Lord. And then there's James and John. A bit more subtle. But it's really the same motivation. They want the power, the authority. They think they deserve it. They think they have it. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand, and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. Now, at face value, it appears this power play is against the other disciples. They're trying to be at a higher level than Peter and Andrew and, and Bartholomew, Matthew, the others. But it's really a power play against Jesus as well. They want to be the neck that moves the head. They want to be the ones that are pulling the strings, and they're trying to pull strings right here. They are attempting to manipulate Jesus to do what they want him to do for them. It's a power play. They are questioning the authority of Jesus. And that brings us to Judas. Judas Iscariot. Talk about a leadership spill. That is exactly what he engineered. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. <laughs> Talk about excessive force. Judas brings along a battalion of the army. They're fully armed, and they come against peaceful Jesus praying in the garden. It's about power. And Judas has stacked the deck in his favor. And he is going to take that power from Jesus. I want you to notice from the account in the Gospel of John of the, the arrest of Jesus. And I want you to see how even in that moment of of treason, Jesus was still very much in control. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? He stepped forward towards them. He's in control. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto him, unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Who's in charge? Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake, Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? 
The first leadership challenge came from Jesus' own disciples, those who were closest to him. It came from Peter, James, John, Judas. And yet we see Jesus never lost control. There's an application for you and I to make. Because Jesus is Lord now and forevermore, let's not challenge his power and his authority. We may fancy ourselves to be close to Jesus. We may think, I would never do something like that. I remind you that the disciples thought they would never do anything like that. And in the darkest hour that Jesus faced, they did exactly that. And let's be careful never to order Jesus around. Let's remember that we live for him. He does not exist for us. And so let's not have a mentality or, or say things or think things towards him like, give me this or stop this from happening. Let's not try to manipulate him either. I gave $50 in the offering. Where's my blessing? Now, Jesus is not so shallow. Let's be submissive to him, not expect him to be submissive to us. Jesus Christ is Lord now and forevermore. Whoever attempts to rise against him is going to lose. Thankfully, Peter, James, and John learned the lesson. And after the resurrection, they submitted to Jesus. They followed him as their king. Judas, on the other hand, the outcome was very different. So the first leadership challenge came from the disciples. The second leadership challenge comes from the merchants. It comes from those who buy and sell. <laughs> These were capitalists with a capital C. I'm in Mark chapter 11. Turn to verses 15 to 19. Mark 11, 15 to 19. What we find here is commercialism has invaded the temple of God. The courtyard that was meant to be a haven to Gentiles seeking the true and living God was now congested with market stalls. And all sorts of things were being bought and sold there. And there were money changers who were extorting pilgrims. All sorts of awful things that were happening in this chaos of the courtyard. Three years earlier, Jesus had chased them out. But in the intervening time, they'd come right back again, thirsty for a prophet. Now I'm going to read about the confrontation. Look at verses 15 to 16. Who comes out better? And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. Jesus is in control. The merchants have lost their attempt to spill him from his own house. He is king now and forever. Third attempt at a leadership spill. This time the faction is the priests. The priests right there in the temple. With the merchants gone, now the priests step up to challenge and try to trap Jesus. In all likelihood, these priests were profiting monetarily from the rent they collected from those merchants. And they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? In other words, Jesus, who do you think you are? The priests feel they are the authority, especially in the temple. They refuse to accept that Jesus is their Messiah, because that would mean he supplants them as the authority. They weren't willing to give that up. They now confront Jesus. 
And I want you to notice that Jesus turns the tables, figuratively speaking, on them by obligating them to first answer a question for him. Who's in charge? <laughs> and Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. Who is in control? With that question, Jesus actually shows the chief priests and the scribes and the elders by whose authority he does what he does. By that question, he demonstrated to them, I am my own authority. I am the King of kings. I am the Lord of lords. I am your Messiah. Jesus is Lord now and forevermore. There's an application for us. Let's recognize that we answer to Jesus. It is not for us to question him or to make demands of him. Now here comes the fourth faction. The fourth attempt at a leadership spill. This time it comes from the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the primary movers in Jewish culture of that day. They especially had allegiance from the common man, from the laborers. They, they were not high and mighty like the Sadducees, who we'll look at in a moment. They, they weren't mixing with the upper crust. The Pharisees, they were the heroes to the common class. If we're talking about politics here in Australia, they'd be the Labor Party. In the United States, they'd be the Democrats, traditionally speaking. But the Pharisees, they maintained their authority, their control, through a system of strict rules and regulations. That's how they kept power over the common people. And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And here's their question. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Oh, what a clever question. And in a very clever context, because they brought the Herodians along. Who are the Herodians? Well, they are Jewish people who are loyal to King Herod to the Roman occupiers. So the Pharisees cleverly bring in people that they ordinarily would consider enemies, but they bring them in so that they'll be there as a witness to the answer Jesus gives. Oh, they think they're so clever. They got him trapped. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? If Jesus answers Yes, it's lawful to give tribute to Caesar. Well, then the Pharisees and all those who follow them will be very upset and will view Jesus as a traitor. But if Jesus says, it's not lawful, then the Herodians will report him to the Romans and they will regard him as an enemy. Either way, Jesus cannot win. So how does Jesus answer? Is he still in control? Verse 17, And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Jesus cleverly took a coin as an object lesson, and he asked, Whose, whose inscription is on here? It's Caesar's. And so Jesus answered the question fully in control and silenced. He put an end to this leadership threat. Next come the Sadducees. The Sadducees, as I mentioned earlier, they are the fifth faction and they represent the wealthy Jewish people, the upper class. So I suppose they would be more like the the Liberal Party here in Australia, or the 
the Republican Party in the United States is kind of traditionally speaking. The Sadducees did not believe in a future resurrection, perhaps because life was pretty good for them here on earth, so they didn't feel intensely the need for something better. But like the Pharisees, they want to trap Jesus. And so they spin this fantastic tale about a woman whose husband died, and then, uh, according to their custom, she's passed on to one of his brothers, but they don't have any children, so down to the next brother, next brother, next brother, until this woman goes through all seven brothers, and all seven brothers end up dying without producing an heir. So here's the question. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. So, they don't really believe in a resurrection, but they pose this hypothetical question because they know that Jesus has been preaching a resurrection, and now they think they've got him trapped with their clever question. But Jesus remains in control. Notice how he answers. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And in verse 27, He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. Certainly, the Sadducees were not used to being put into their place, but that's exactly what Jesus did with his reply. He is Lord now and forevermore. Here comes faction number six. It's the scribes. Who are the scribes? The scribes are the theologians. They, they study the word of God and they teach the word of God. How will these biblical scholars challenge Jesus? Verse 28 of chapter 12. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Well, in actual fact, this is not an attempt at a leadership spill. This is a genuine question, and Jesus treats it that way. Now, other scribes wouldn't have asked Jesus in that, that same light, but this particular scribe is ask, asking an honest question. In verse 34, we get the answer. And when Jesus saw that this man had answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. What right did Jesus have to make that judgment that this scribe was not far from the kingdom of God? He had every right, because he is Lord now and forevermore. The verse clearly said that the leadership challenges stopped after that point. But there is one more for us to cover. It's not a challenge from a faction of men. It is a challenge from the reality of sin. This Seventh and final challenge is from the curse, the curse itself. This is the biggest challenge to Jesus' authority and power. Early in his ministry, Jesus made this claim. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, arise and walk. Jesus showed that power. But the crucible is the cross. Through his death on the cross, will Jesus prove his power? Will this be the greatest demonstration of his power? Will he go to the cross as a victim? Will it be a surprise to him? 
Or will Jesus go to the cross as a volunteer, exercising his greatest power in death for the atonement of humans? I want you to notice the word of authority from Jesus. In John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Do you see that even in the cross, Jesus is demonstrating his power? He alone had the authority to make atonement, and he appropriated that authority. He was not a victim. He was a volunteer and, ultimately, the victor. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 45. We covered this recently. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life, not to have his life taken, but to give his life a ransom for many. Philip Ryken illustrates the point that is being made here. He writes, Most kingdoms do anything they can to protect their king. That's the unspoken premise of the game of chess, isn't it? You use all of the other pieces in the game of chess to protect the king at all costs. You might even sacrifice one of your chess pieces for the benefit of of the king because we all know that when a king falls a kingdom falls and so the king is protected a notable example Riken cites comes from the allied invasion of normandy on d-day 6 june 1944. british prime minister winston churchill was determined that he would join the expeditionary force, and that he would watch the invasion from the bridge of a battleship. U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was desperate to stop Churchill from going close to the battlefield like that. He feared that the prime minister might be killed in battle, and if that were to happen, the tide of the war would turn. Being unsuccessful at appealing to Churchill, Eisenhower appealed to a higher power. He went to King George VI, and King George went to Churchill, and he informed him that he would accompany Churchill on the bridge of the battleship. If Churchill would be there watching the troops, well, then the king would be there too. To that, Churchill relented. The thought of the king being risked was too great of a price to risk. King Jesus did exactly the opposite. With royal courage, he surrendered his body to be crucified. On the cross, he offered a king's ransom. He exchanged his life for yours. The crown of thorns that he wore in mockery was a crown that you and I deserve because of our sinfulness. That crown, paradoxically, now symbolizes his kingship. For having atoned for our sins successfully, he rose from the dead, proving he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who deserves all crowns upon his head. And so we see that Jesus is king now and forevermore. Leadership spills. Attempts are still being made today. We have legislation that is being passed in our country restricting freedom of religion, freedom of speech. We have rules being introduced in public spaces to prevent Christians from talking about Jesus or talking about sin or talking or quoting from the Bible. 
social media censors those who would speak the truth. And we're finding this all around us. Leadership challenges. But take, take comfort, take hope in this. Whereas the seven that brought a challenge to Jesus when he walked on this earth failed to succeed, so too all who attempt to supplant Jesus today will likewise fail. So hold true to your allegiance to Jesus. The threats will increase. Stand with Jesus Christ, because he is coming again, and he will be the King of kings and Lord of lords for all eternity. Will you be there with him? Heavenly Father, we pray you would strengthen our faith, our resolve, and our courage. May our lives demonstrate that Jesus is our King now and forevermore. We pray this in his name. Amen. Despite all attempts, past and present, to spill Jesus from leadership, it will never happen. In fact, someday soon he will come again, and then every eye will see and every heart will know that Jesus is King and Lord. Here's our benediction. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>